Hello people, today I'm going to be doing a presentation on problems with the peer review process. So to get started, I'm going to tell you a little story about a man named Theophilus Painter. Painter was born in 1921. He was an American zoologist who specialized in research on chromosomes. So one day he's in his lab and he's looking at meiotic cells under a microscope trying to count the number of human chromosomes. And the count that he ends up coming up with was 24. People who were reviewing his work managed to reproduce the same number, but others also counted between 19 and 23 pairs of chromosomes. And the reason for this is that the experiment was actually really difficult to do. The chromosomes were tangled up together in a big uh, glob, tangled mess. And uh, the difficulty of the experiment led to the consensus being that Painter's authority um, on the subject mattered and that the original count actually was 24. And this was actually an error that persisted for 34 years before it was corrected by Joe Hin Cho. Um, there was actually 23 pairs of chromosomes, and he did this by studying somatic cells. Um, Cho Jin Zhou is a uh, Indonesian-born American cytogeneticist, and this is mostly what he's well known for. And this all just goes to show you that the peer review process is not a reliable method of determining the validity and correctness of scientific claims. Uh, a study done by Schoenfeld and Uandis in uh, 2013 shows that most foods are actually associated with cancer in uh, contradictory ways. Here on the left hand side you see that wine uh, both protects against cancer and causes cancer with six studies uh, saying that it protects against and three that saying that it causes it. Um, this is obviously impossible. It can't both cause and prevent cancer. Uh, the infographic here is done by Vox but the information comes from the study. And so this all leads into something called the replicability crisis, which is mostly prevalent within the medical sciences, especially within psychological studies. And here it's estimated that nearly two-thirds of published studies are false. And this comes from a paper by Gorman in 2019 that where they took a hundred different studies and they tried to reproduce them, and they were only able to reproduce with positive results 36 of the studies, which is concerning considering that 97% of the studies actually claimed to have positive results. Uh, so many peer-reviewed and published studies are also contradictory to each other, which was shown by the previous infographic from the Schoenfield and Andy Landis paper. And statistics seem to be the primary cause, because uh, this comes from our Aguinas in 2017, which shows that data is omitted, tweaked, or interpreted to reach a particular conclusion. Uh, and so this all goes to show that peers in scientific journals shouldn't be blindly trusted. Publication within a journal does not correlate with validity or reliability. A uh, paper written by Andrew Wakefield and published in Lancet 2008 connected autism, uh, mumps, and measles to vaccines, which started an anti-vax movement. Uh, Wakefield was eventually found guilty of professional misconduct by the General Medical Council for undisclosed financial conflict of interest. And this just goes to show that people can create fictitious information for monetary or political gain. Uh, as well, scientific journals are biased in favor of known individuals and institutions, which is one of the reasons why the paper was published in the Lancet magazine. It actually was not received very well by his peers, but Lancelot published it anyways because he was uh, rather famous at the time. And scientific journals are biased against publishing retractions or studies with negative results, which means that some studies are never uh, publicly retracted, and so information tends to persist within the scientific community. And reviewers also have their own biases against new theories that disagree with their own research or worldview. And this leads into my third point, which is that peer review impedes scientific progress. Reviewers are still human. Uh, reviewers are biased in favor of information that reinforces their worldview and may be willing to validate false information if they believe that the ends justify the means. Reviewers may also be willing to validate poor information if it could lead to more funding for their own research. And reviewers may not actually understand what it is that they're reviewing due to overuse of technical jargon, abstract mathematics, and radical new ideas. Uh, so leading into something called the not-so-great filter, uh, 30 to 65 percent of submitted research is rejected by editors before it can even reach the peer review process, and the review process can take months or years to finish. Reviewers also fail to detect fraud in 60 to 75 percent of errors. Everything in this paragraph comes from a study by Bauer in 2020. And reviewers are biased against undesired outcomes, innovation, and certain methodologies in individuals or institutions, which comes from a paper by Richard Smith in 1988. And I guess now is a good time to quote something by William Shakespeare that says that it's always the wrong person that gives you the right lessons in life. Uh, if you're not the right person, it doesn't matter if you're saying the same thing, uh, you're wrong. And it's a, it's a mess, really. Uh, the fallibility of the peer review process shows that we should all practice critical thinking instead of just assuming that information is correct based on authority or consensus. If we were 
insisting upon doing this, we'd probably still be believing that humans have 24 chromosomes today, which is a little bit concerning considering that that condition is called Down syndrome. Anyway, that's the end of my presentation. Here you can find uh, links to all of the works that were cited in this presentation. Thank you for watching.